Hello and welcome. I'm Dan McDermott. This is the McDermott Report. We're broadcasting live at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, midnight GMT for all our GMT viewers. Uh, joining me, as she often does, is Lynchburg Times senior political writer Emily Williams. Emily, thanks so much for being here again. Hi, Dan. Great to be back. And also with us is a Front Royal Virginia attorney, Tom Sayer, who's here to kind of analyze. Now, I want to clarify, he's not an Illinois attorney or a Massachusetts attorney, um, but he is going to offer us a little bit of analysis on our lead story, uh, which I find outrageous, and I'm eager to hear what he thinks. Tom, thanks so much for being with us tonight. It's good to be here, Dan. Thank you for having me here. Okay. All right. So that was our audio check, uh, surreptitiously, as it were. All right. So uh, first, I'm just going to – I'll give a brief background, then I'm going to throw it to Tom. But there is a case of a, a gentleman in Illinois who uh, – some, some police officers came. Uh, the original incident was they came because he had some unregistered vehicles, apparently, at a house, and he recorded the, um, the transaction. Now, what some states – some states have – um, different laws regarding audio recording. In some states, like Virginia, where I am, where actually all three of us are, the law says that if either party consents, in other words, I could have, I could call Tom Sayer up and I could make an audio recording of that call without telling him or, or getting his consent, and that's perfectly legal. Now, whether that's admissible in court is a different story, and another technicality that Tom can get into is if you're an attorney, then there's a bar rule against you doing it. But, um, What's happening in some states is police are using these uh, eavesdropping, wiretapping laws to go after folks who record them. And the way they do it, you know, you could be across the street with your camera, and uh, the video's fine, but the, the camera, if it's making an audio recording as well, then in some of these states, people are being charged with crimes for illegally uh, eavesdropping on the police, even though they're on duty performing their official job. And so this gentleman because of uh, he's facing five felony counts in Chicago, Illinois. It's a 15-year felony uh, for doing this. And, and in my opinion, obviously, it, this is a clear First Amendment issue. Um, you have a right to record public officials as long, unless you're in their way or if you're harassing them or in their face or somehow, you know, uh, preventing justice from occurring. If you're across the street with your camera, we have a long history of this. Um, um, real quick, the, the John F. Kennedy assassination. There are all sorts of conspiracy theories about whether Lee Harvey Oswald shot Kennedy and whether he did it alone. There are no conspiracy conspiracy theories about whether Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald because that was recorded on television. Everyone saw it. It was live TV. Um, another case more recently is Rodney King. Um, that would not have been the worldwide case that it had been if it was brought to any attention at all had it not been for someone with a camera making a, a film or video recording of um, police officers, you know, beating up Rodney King. And then that was a big legal thing, which is a whole separate story. But we have a long, we have a history in this country and in all countries um, where you need to record, you know, citizen journalists. Now, th that's that's the, the twist here. In the past, there was sort of uh, the citizen and then there was this wall and then there was this the media. Um, the New York Times, the Washington Post, then the broadcast networks came into play when that technology came along. But now the lines are blurred. And in the second part of the story, they address that very well. But the lines between official sanctioned media and citizen journalists or anybody who has a blog or a phone with, you know, and the proliferation of these devices. Everyone's got a camera on them now. Your, tele your, your phone is a, as a camera. I'm sitting with, within five cameras, not including the one you're looking at me through. So it's a, it's a new time, and it's a really interesting topic that some states, uh, the law enforcement authorities, are turning to this eavesdropping law to these states that don't that have a, a dual consent requirement. So I'm going to bring in an attorney, uh, Tom Sayer, who graciously agreed to be on the show tonight, and he, he's not involved in this case at all, and he's not an Illinois attorney; he's a Virginia attorney. But I wanted a legal mind, and I know one thing about Tom: you can say about the guy is he's very he can brief himself very quickly and very thoroughly more so than the layman so we're going to bring tom in here uh for what it's worth a virginia attorney <laughs> to offer us some opinion on this uh illinois case and the general concept and including the uh the unrelated but interesting decision um technically unrelated but interesting decision that happened in massachusetts 
So, Tom, welcome, and uh, what's your take on this whole story? Well, actually, Dan, I'm also I'm licensed in West Virginia as well. Well, the case with Michael Allison is very interesting in that he did something in public. He had a camera. He, fell, he, he uh, filmed the police in public, and they're using it as, a, as leverage against him in a lawsuit that Mr. Allison has filed against the police. So I think that speaks volumes right there. But I think the more important thing is is that there is no expectation of privacy in public. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that over and over and over again. Uh, it goes a lot like Harry Krishnas that were in airports and handing out stuff that people thought was offensive, and you had to figure out whether an airport, whether or not the public had a expectation of privacy in an airport. So if it's a public place, there's clearly no expectation of privacy, whether you're a police officer or whoever you are. So I think if this ever goes up to the U.S. Supreme Court, they'll clearly rule in favor of somebody like what Michael Allison did. Okay, now th- this brings up the whole concept. This country, you know, we're fighting overseas to rid countries of dictators and to instill um, a localized version of, you know, what you could call a Western democracy, which has varying levels of effectiveness over there. And then here at home, this sort of thing that is just completely shocking to me happens. Um, Emily, I'm, I'm guessing you had a similar reaction, although you used to be a reporter in uh, Boston. Uh, what, what's your take on, on this case of the Illinois man first? You're still on mute, Emily. Emily, I'm not getting any audio from you. Did you mute? I'm not getting anything, Emily. Um, and I had it fine before. You want to... Um, I'm not getting anything. Um, I can still hear you, Dan. Yeah, she's here. I can hear you, and you can hear me, but I'm not um, picking anything up from Emily. I'm not sure. You want to try to call back real quick, Emily? All right, we're going to... This is uh, definitely a live program, if anyone doubted us. Emily, um... You can hear me. I, I cannot hear you, though. Let me see if anything's going on here. Let me look at my... Uh... You should be coming in line two. Um, I'm going to do a quick test here. I'm going to... I apologize, Tom, and to our viewers. Um... Yeah, definitely. Let's see here. Um... Well, you're definitely coming in on line two, so let me see here. I'm not sure what's going on, Emily. Um, why don't you want to, uh, can you call the number? This is strange. I'm not sure if, um, I'm not sure what is going on. Um. Right. And presently in Illinois, it is against the law to record law enforcement without their consent. My understanding is that that's the law in about 12 states. And um, you know, as, a, as a lawyer, and I think that that's a violation of First Amendment free speech. He has a list of about seven things that I think his lawyer placed in his brief, but the strongest one is the First Amendment free speech. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, I think uh, it's crazy. One of the things I've noticed, the media, you know, is up in arms because obviously 
um, you know, you get a lot of good stories off of things that are on uh, video because video doesn't lie. As you were bringing up some of your other examples, uh, you know, who shot who and this and that, it's because a video is, is extremely important. And believe me, the prosecution knows that too, and so do police. That's why they love their videos. And that's why they don't want to be videos <laughs> because uh, they're very damning if you do something inappropriate. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, and there, there is a, a favorable decision that just came out in the U.S. First Circuit Court of Appeals in the Boston area, which serves in the New England area. They issued a resounding and unanimous opinion in support of the First Amendment to record police actions in public. And in that case, there was a, a black female... A uh, woman looked like it about in her 20s was on a train, I think, a station somewhere, and the police came on to the train to arrest a young man who evidently was drunk in public, and she was just filming, and they asked her to stop, and she and she didn't. They handcuffed her and arrested her and put her in a police car and and deleted her video, and she sued, and the uh, U.S. Supreme, the U.S. Court of Appeals, has ruled in her favor. In her favor, and rightfully so. Wow, that's that's something else. Um, yeah, that's. Uh, and what do you think about this case? It's unrelated. Um, the case in Massachusetts. Do these typically um, the, the, were the Massachusetts Federal Appeals Court uh, one step below the U.S. Supreme Court? But it only impacts uh, it only impacts Massachusetts. But do these things tend to? Um, do they have a tendency to influence other courts? Well, sure. It's very good precedence because it is a, a United States Court of Appeals. There's only, uh, you know, a certain number of Court of Appeals around the United States, and they they cover, you know, wide areas of a region, normally about four or five states. So, yes, they carry a lot of weight. Okay. In the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, if this case got in federal court, they would look at it. And but right now, I think Michael Allison is in state court in Illinois. But it really what it is, it's an intimidation tactic used by the police. Now, you know, as I was mentioning to you earlier, Dan, I'm a law and order type guy, and I, and I think you know, obviously, to have good police protection is important. But also, there are some bad apples, and it's also equally important to have the public allowed to have videos, one, to protect themselves, and two, maybe to protect somebody else getting hurt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's bring uh, Emily in, who's call. I apologize for the technical glitch. I still don't understand what happened. But, Emily, what's your take on this whole story? Well, I think that, you know, this, this man wasn't a journalist, but this is the kind of thing that really affects the press. Um, I know that and most of my take on it is going to be very anecdotal, and, you know, I, I hate that, so I apologize to people. But my personal experience with dealing with um, police officers and a reporter, as a reporter, um, dates back to grad school, we were, we were taking pictures and videotaping um, out on the street in front of police headquarters in Boston. Um, we were doing a story on police officers that were parking their personal vehicles in handicap and illegal spots right in front of police headquarters because they were under the assurance that the parking authority would not ticket them. Um, so, you know, police corruption on a small scale, I suppose, um, but it was a big deal to some people. Um, you know, definitely the people that were handicapped and trying to visit police headquarters thought it was a big deal. So, you know, and with all of the reporting that we were doing, I mean, we were assured by our rights that, you know, we could take pictures and take video if we needed to. And, you know, once once those rights are taken away somewhere, you know, even somewhere that doesn't, like, somewhere that has laws that would prevent those rights from being taken away, it really has a ripple-like effect for your confidence level um, throughout the nation. And, I mean, as far as freedom of the press is concerned, the United States only ranks 20 of all the nations in the world on and these are the rankings done by reporters without borders which is a pretty well respected um group um so we're we're by no means the most 
free place to report. And when stuff like this happens, it just, you know, it knocks us down a little more. Um, and it's, it's really a shame. Tom, what do you, uh, what are you supposed to do? I mean, we, we both know a bunch of police officers, as, as is Emily, and, and by and large, they're good, honest, hardworking guys. But what are you supposed to do when, uh, I mean, what, what are folks, th- this doesn't make any sense. I mean, who do you call when, when you have a, when the cops are bad, you know? What are you supposed to do if, if you can't defend yourself with, with a videotape? Well, if you get, there are certain actions you can file in court, but, you know, again, if you have it on video, it's very helpful because, you know, it's not a he said, she said story. It's what you can watch on video. You know, I have many clients that come to me, just this is one example, I was on a school bus and my client, you know, said he didn't do too much and now it's all the video on the school bus and there was four or five students that did quite a lot. And, it was very interesting hearing what they said versus what was on the video. So obviously having the video is very important. Prosecution knows that the police know it. And again, I said earlier, that's exactly why they don't want you to record. Right. I mean, catch them doing something wrong. And yeah, there are legitimate re, I mean, some, some, some office, you're at the mercy of the editor of the video. So, uh, someone could theoretically, you know, they could videotape you and make you look bad. Um, with creative editing, etc. But um, yeah, it just seems to me that uh, um, if you're innocent, and you know. If you... A police officer could... mm-hmm. Go ahead, Tom. You said a police officer, a police officer could. Police officer could lose their, they could lose their temper and and hit somebody or or push somebody or something. And if it's caught on video, they would be reprimanded, and I'm sure they don't want that to happen. And there's just lots of things that could that could happen. But obviously, if somebody's walking down the street and they're on a sidewalk and they're, they pull out a, their cell phone and record something, I think that's outrageous for them to be charged for, with a crime. And, and that's what Illinois is trying to do here. Yeah, and especially Chicago, which, as I said, has a 15-year felony attached to this sort of thing. It just uh, It's clearly abuse of, of police power. And I, th- I don't know what their oath is, but I... Uh, if they have to swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States, um, clearly, the, the, you know, enforcing rules like this and interpreting a, an eavesdropping rule to this effect would be clearly violating the spirit, if not the letter of the Constitution. And hopefully this um, – I can't see this sticking, especially now that it's getting so much attention from folks. Um, you know, the, the, there's nothing like sunset to, uh, to correct wrongs, but um, – Anything? Any final thoughts on this case, Emily? I mean, none beyond that. The most important thing is that, you know, the citizens and the press representing citizens, you know, we, we're responsible for being that check and balance to every government institution. I mean, that's why we're here. And that's it's everyone's job. And, you know, you put your money towards journalism and towards newspapers to help you do that, to make sure that, you know, your tax money is going. Welcome to Blog Talk Radio. Please enter your host pin. When finished, press the pound key. Man, I have no idea what the heck just happened, Emily. I that this it is does get fought all the way up to the upper level because I'm sure the pin at some point that just realizes how ridiculous it is to have something like this. Happen. Re-enter your pin. Hang on one sec, Emily. This is bizarre. I'm having all these weird issues. Um, the pin you entered does not matter. All right, hang on. Oh God, I've got to go. This is crazy. I've never had this. Is embarrassing. I've never had this happen, Tom. Hello, I apologize. Thank- yeah. I don't know what what it's doing. Um, In order to complete this call, you must dial the area code and the telephone number. Thank you for using Magic Jack. Wow, I have no idea. I'm trying to. I'm using a Magic Jack to call it. This is crazy. Um, all right, if it cuts us off, we'll know because you'll both disappear. Um, Emily, were you done? I'm sorry. I'm kind of flustered because I'm trying to figure out. I have no idea what the problem is. 
Emily, are you there? Tom, are you there? All right. Okie doke. Let's see. Welcome to Blog Talk Radio. Please enter your host pin. When finished, press the pound key. It appears that the host has already dialed into this show. Only one host is allowed per show. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> All right, this is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, yeah, I had to call in. Um, I got disconnected, but it wouldn't disconnect me from the control panel, so it thought I was still calling in, so I tried to call back in, and then it said I've already called in, but I couldn't hang up on the original call. So what I did, I just said call a guest, and I called back to myself, and that's how I got on. This is bizarre. Um and, uh, Tom, I apologize. This isn't our normal, uh, uh this that's, has never happened before. This is the first time I've had a Skype caller video and blog talk radio at the same time. And obviously that's not going to work. Um, so anyway, um, all right, Emily, tell me about the car story you had. <laughs> all right. Well, we, we were just talking about how Netflix is losing investors, which is a good segue into, um, car sales. Apparently, um, auto sales, mostly for U.S. companies, um, were up for the month of August, which is, you know, completely against what everyone would think based on what the economy has been doing and the hurricane and everything else that would make people not want to run out and buy cars. Um, but, you know, they, they were up. Let's see, Ford, Ford saw an 11% increase, GM saw 18%, and Chrysler... Um, says that it's had the best sales. August sales were the best in four years with a 31% increase. Um, so, you know, it's really interesting that they're doing so well, but unfortunately, their stocks are still down. <laughs> um, you know, they're, uh, they're still going down even with these great numbers that just came out. So, um, you know, it's, it's nice to see the U.S. companies performing well. They actually, uh, both Toyota and Honda went down for the month of August, so they're outperforming, you know, the foreign companies a little bit, um, which is great to see for our country. Um, but, 
you know, as I was reading this article, and um, this is this is going to launch into a little bit of personal note. I'm actually in the market for a car right now, and you know, I was I was pleasantly just surprised to see how affordable and how good gas mileage the U.S. companies' new little cars are getting. Um, you know, there's some great hatchbacks out there that are you know very competitive and much cheaper than what Honda and Toyota are offering. Um, so. You know, if, if I had to guess why their sales are doing well, it might be because they actually have hit the market that they need to for our country right now. Tom, that seems like it's been a problem for a long time, hasn't it, that they were building the wrong vehicles uh, for demand, that they, when, when gas prices skyrocketed, all these dealers were just loaded up with SUVs. They got very bad gas mileage, and they, you couldn't find a, a place that was selling it a smaller car, and then they were raising the prices sometimes sticker or above for some of these cars that got great mileage when the the gas first shot up like crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's what they did. I would say in the last, you know, 10 years, they were making all these vehicles that just had horrible gas mileage. And now recently, definitely I'd say within the last three to four years, they're making these cars that are good, dependable vehicles. Some of them are hybrids, and the ones that aren't are even up in the 30s and 40s, and they're, they're doing fantastic. And with the gas prices sky high, everybody wants these cars that get better gas mileage. And another thing that I think happened, <clears throat> we people have been holding back buying a new car for so long, and that now you know things are starting to break a little bit in the car industry. And people are out there purchasing a new car because their car is now, you know, 10 or 15 years old. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I've got my 07 uh, Taurus still hanging in there. Um, I know Emily needs, uh, you need a car. You really need a car because now your boyfriend, you were, you used to live across, literally across the street from where he worked. And then uh, your job is largely, uh, as a reporter, um, your job is, you know, covering stuff. Sometimes you, you you're on the phone talking to people, but now you're 30 minutes away from uh, his his work. So yeah, it's time to get it's time to make the plunge. Or we can get a little mo- moped. I know there's some uh, folks running mopeds around Lynchburg. Yeah, you know, we've been I've been driving the same. It's an I I drive a '95 Honda Accord, um, and it was a high school graduation present. So to the map, I've been driving it for quite a long time, and it's made the drive all around. New England several times, and <laughs> it's it's ready. It's ready to go. It's rusted through like any good northern car should be. <laughs> and yeah, I no, I've, and I've been, you know, I've, I'm looking at those small hatchbacks, and I was pleasantly surprised to see that Ford has a very competitive one in the Ford Fiesta, which, you know, if you know your history of cars, and Ford with their funny named cars, you might be a little skeptical that the Fiesta is a good vehicle, but Man, it's it's outperforming the uh, Mazda 2, which is the you know identical car in its class. So, I'm seriously considering going American, which is something that I you know two years ago would never have considered. I don't know if you're allowed to, being an N- NPR listener, if you're allowed to buy an American car, Emily. Won't this uh, upset <laughs> your? Uh... <laughs> did you hear? Did you hear that the labor secretary? sound like my oldest daughter Emily. she likes uh, hondas well you can't go wrong the yeah. car talk okay the, I, the car talk guys on npr say oh you want a safe car buy a honda that's what they say they last forever <laughs> get your daughter a honda well, you next admit, caller my car is, <laughs> my car is going on well, i mean i would probably stick in for another couple years it could probably do 20 years worth this car and you know it, it hasn't seen an easy life that like Two hundred and six, almost two hundred and seventy thousand miles on it now, and you know it's still running. It's it's rusty though, and I I am a little embarrassed when I get out of it in the supermarket parking lot. <laughs> it's time to move on, as I say. <laughs> um, Tom, what do you what do you get your daughters? Um, I'm pretty much more of a GM kind of guy. Uh, I like to buy American cars personally myself, but uh, <laughs> and Toyota's making and so is Honda making them in America too. Uh, any, I wanted to mention that uh, Emily mentioned about mopeds, and and that's something a lot of people are doing, as you see in the European countries and in China and Japan. 
And also, a lot of the municipalities around America are, are going to the bike path route. And that, that's something we're trying to do here in Virginia. And I know they have it in Lynchburg down where Emily lives. They have a lot of bike paths. And that, that's good transportation, and it's also good exercise. Yeah, it's neat. It's good yeah, family you know, stuff. I, I was, I'm impressed by, yeah, there's a, there's a good bike path in Lynchburg, but as far as, like, using your bike to commute around here, it's almost impossible. I actually, I'm, people who follow our show regularly will, will, will have heard that I had to run before the show last night because I, I had to pick a friend up at the hospital that actually broke her arm riding her bike home from work. Um, because there just aren't breakdown lanes around here to ride in. There aren't bike paths on the roads. Um, and it's really, I mean, on a personal note, I moved to Lynchburg from Germany where there's just bike lanes everywhere you go. And it really is very doable to bike to work. Um, but around here it's really dangerous, um, and it's a shame. I'd love to bike to work. <laughs> there's a, Frankly, there's a lot about Lynchburg that's dangerous, not just the bikes. Tom? About the car sales being up in August, I think they're going to continue to go up. And I understand that the used car prices spiked in July. They were all-time high, and they're expecting them to go down in August. I haven't seen the used car sales for August, but I think it's going down. And um, that, that is also an indication that I think the new people are shifting over to buying a new car. And maybe they're spending, uh, since they're saving so much money, not paying their, their mortgage payment. <laughs> maybe they have more money to buy a car. Um, that, that was flippant and a joke. Um, okay, so, Emily, the so conversation... The you, cars are very expensive. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Uh, and uh, rentals now are hot. If uh, these landlords who suffered so long uh, when everybody and his brother could buy a house... Um, and uh, nobody was renting. Everyone was buying a house. Someone makes twenty grand a year. They'd sign whatever form with no verification. They'd buy a you know hundred fifty thousand dollar house, and now they're getting foreclosed on. Uh, it was an awful time. But now, now the rental places there's a line to get in. As Emily's discovered, uh, um, luckily in Lynchburg, there's a, a, a big number of rental places because they just moved. Because her boyfriend's a nuclear engineer, and so they never know from year to year where they're going to be. So they can't really buy. Uh, so, um, they did a lease and she went through that on the show for a while. She was mulling over all the different options. Um, I wanted to hit the, the Netflix thing because that was not recorded. Uh, you two could hear each other, but you weren't coming in. Um, you were going to blog talk radio, but you were not coming in at all on this. So if, if, uh, I have no idea what you two said. So if you two want to hit that again, that would be terrific. Yeah, I'll, I'll give a quick rundown. Um, you know, we've, we've covered Netflix quite a bit on the show, um, everything from their rate increase to uh, their horrible customer service that time that they went down for the weekend. Um, but the, the newest Netflix news, and of course on a negative note, is, as is the trend as of late, um, is that they were unable to reach a contract agreement with Stars, um, who provides a lot of their, you know, newer, more popular movies to the service. Um, so as a result, the Star's content will not be available on Netflix in the future. Um, so of course, Google Plus was a buzz today about this news. Everyone saying things from, I'm glad I already dropped the service, to I can't believe that they're hiking our rates and taking out movies. And it was, it was largely negative, um, of course. <laughs> and this is, I mean, this is not, not a good thing for Netflix to hear. I mean, they haven't had a lot of good press lately. And this is just another, you know, knock off the block. Um, but, you know, I, I'm an avid Netflix user, and I, I will be bummed. I actually have already gone through my instant queue, identified which movies are from stars, and put them at the top to make sure that I watch them before they disappear. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, I'm not too worried. There's still a lot of content on Netflix, and I still feel like I'm, you know, getting away with highway robbery from paying so little. Um, when, you know, Netflix for us substitutes for cable. We only get the most basic of the basic, the, you know, 12 bucks a month package, and we just use Netflix for everything. So. I watch it every night, and it freaks me out when they – yeah, I watch Netflix. Uh, I, I like them, and uh, when they – when there's a problem when they go down or something, it's funny because millions and millions of people will go on Facebook and 
Twitter and just freak out because it's like the, their world has ended because they don't have Netflix. And then everyone races to the Redbox machine and the only thing left are, you know, cartoons or um, some Harry Potter movie you've watched 50 times already. But uh, it's interesting because the price increase is going to go up because they recently, as we've said in the show before, they just they separated. It used to be you could pay for the streaming service, which was what, seven ninety nine, then you can add $2.00. Or I think I, I forget what I paid, 14 or whatever. But now they've separated it, and there's no discount for getting both. And it's um, a lot more expensive, like 60% increase to get DVDs by mail and the streaming service. Um, and then this, this that kicks in September 1 or whenever your next billing date is. So a lot of people have canceled uh, anticipating this. And I may cancel because I find I can get by with Redbox. I really don't use it. I think I've... I've had two DVDs. I've watched them both, and I don't think I've even bothered to return them. And probably I've had them for a couple weeks, and I haven't. I'm, I'm just not using it now. So I'm, I'll probably cancel the DVD thing because, frankly, the, the only time I need it is when they're down, and I can just run to the Red Box and get uh, you know a movie there for a dollar. And they've got this other store in Front Royal. I think is a dollar a movie. The the two kids own it right next to Martin's. Tom, what do you guys do? Do you are you you got like five thousand cable channels and three hundred dollars a month cable bill or Netflix? What do you do? Well, I'm actually looking at the Netflix here on the internet, and I can see what it is. It's just regular movies that you can view. So yes, and there are places around town where I live here in Front Royal, Virginia, that you can get movies very cheap. About a dollar, you have to return it within a day or two. But um, I'm not a huge movie watcher, but I do, you know, I do have cable TV, one of which I like to watch EWTN. But it is, uh, it is very interesting all the all the things that you can get now on TV and, and in the movies. There's so much, or there's probably too much. Yeah. Um... And I imagine, Tom, you're a big Fox News Channel viewer, <laughs> being a Republican politician. Yeah. Um, speaking of Fox News, this is interesting. Uh, part of it's not surprising. Part of it is a news today from Orlando, Florida, that Fox News is going to host a Republican debate hosted by Brett Baer. Um, and it's the, the co-host is Google. Of all people, that's surprising. So Google and Fox News are going to team up, um, and I'm get I'm not sure if it's a YouTube. Um, it says the debate will combine questions you submit on YouTube with maps, facts, and information to enrich and guide the discussion. YouTube's head of news and politics, Steve Grove, said in a blog post. Uh, Throughout the evening, we'll use Google's public data and search trends on air to give greater context to the questions and help you make a more informed decision at the polls. In November of 2012. That's interesting. Um, we'll all be well, watching that. I like to watch. Um, yeah, I like to watch all the uh, the other shows too, MSNBC, and and see some of my liberal friends what they have to say. It's very very interesting. Yeah, I like I like Chris Matthews, um, and I like O'Reilly on Fox, and I like um, once in a while I like uh, Rachel Maddow was pretty good, but sometimes she just too party line democrat for me to stomach um just when they're wrong and she's saying it and then sometimes uh some of the folks on fox are too party line right wing uh when they're wrong and and so I, i'm kind of a you know i'm right of center probably but i'm i'm not a partisan talking points guy i want someone who can think and and tell me something but uh, yeah they're, they're on both channels are good and uh what do you think about the lineup tom uh i guess the latest is rick perry and this debate on september the seventh um, that bumped uh, President Obama's speech to a joint session uh, will be Rick, not officially, but probably realistically, that's the reason. Um, after an exchange of very politely worded uh, letters between the president and Speaker Boehner, it was shifted to the eighth, and now it's going to potentially conflict with a super with a football game. Uh, the kickoff of the NFL's regular season, so obviously they're going to do some scheduling there. But what do you think of the lineup? Uh, are you a Rick Perry fan or Bachman, or what, what's your uh, what are you thinking of for the Republican nomination? Well, I haven't made a, any decision with the Republican primary at this moment. I'm just you know waiting to see how it shakes out, and I like to hear all the different pundits what they have to say and 
how everybody's maneuvering for this and maneuvering for that. And something I found very interesting is the Tea Party was very popular about a year or so ago, and now it seems like they've lost their love affair with the press. Uh, the press is uh, getting on them now. I don't know if they're getting on. I mean, I think that they. I would argue the opposite. I think that um, they're having a tremendous impact now. They basically single-handedly caused the president to compromise on and and won, or they're credited with winning their side's view on this uh, budget, uh, the the debt ceiling increase. Isn't that the way you took it, Emily? Um, You know, yeah, I think that's what they I think that when you say when when we talk about the media's love affair with them dwindling, I think that there's been a lot less coverage of the Tea Party than there was when they were new and you know a hip topic. And now I think that yeah, that there isn't enough attention being paid to their influence in the press. Um, but uh, yeah, I I, um, I think that they have a they have a big hand. I mean, I just. The most recent is that um, Romney has started courting them, realizing that he's going to need their votes in order to win the nomination. So we might see his campaign take a change in the near future. It's a strange phenomenon because there isn't leadership. It started when when Rick Santelli said on CNN we should have a Tea Party, and he was ranting and raving about something. And then, uh, then I guess, but there's no real leadership. It's the biggest grassroots thing I've ever seen in America. There really isn't any organized. I mean, there's there's websites and there are people who in leadership positions who are favorites of the Tea Party types. But um, it started out as rallies. I know, like in Front Royal, for example, Tom, you remember this? Tim Radigan has held. Uh, he's sort of the, a leader of a Tea Party group in Front Royal, and he had a rally, and there were a lot of folks there, um, and not just you know, not not just people you, who would normally expect to be at a political you know activist uh, street theater event. Business owners, and then then there was a couple more rallies, and and each time the the attendance would diminish. But I guess they're going mainstream. But it's surprisingly it's surprising to me how effective they are when, by their very nature, there is no hierarchy, there's no organization, no nobody's in charge with subcommittee chairman and different groups. It's just sort of a bunch of ad hoc groups that uh, communicate with each other and are. Sim- similarly minded, but there's no structure to it. But look what they've been able to accomplish, mainly by threatening that if you don't vote a certain way, expect a challenge in the Republican primary. And that threat is the single handed thing that caused the debt ceiling increase to go on as long as it did and eventually be decided largely in the Republicans' favor. Well, the most amazing thing, and Dan, you're right, is that. They actually won elections. I, you know, I'm I'm a very big political animal, and I follow politics, and I love it. And I didn't think these people, most of them, stood a chance of you know winning, much less doing very well in the election. And not only did they do well, but many of them were winning, and it was, I mean, it really caught a lot of people off guard. And they, uh, you know, I think it helped bring, I think, more trust. In politics and that you know a wide variety of different people got elected it was good to see a lot of incumbents get beat i think it's the same thing as just like with this this one guy who was videotaping the police and the police got upset you know the government doesn't want everybody watching them too close and you know we get these new movements up and and they demand you know more to come closer to the people and listen to the people more and and uh, there'll be another rally of a group of people and then you know say five years from now it's just the tea party really won a lot of elections and they knocked off some big incumbents well also you know when people on on that they have won some elections and they've had some real doozies um the delaware the i'm not a witch i'm you um candidate uh that took out in the primary took out a guy who was heavily favored and would have won the election in the general and they they bumped him off and put in uh, I, I I'm embarrassed I can't remember her name uh, maybe Emily remembers and then uh, she just went was defeated soundly and it wasn't because of the I'm a witch thing it was there were many reasons she just was not ready for prime time and that level for Senate but uh, the the whole specter like you're a, Christine O'Donnell 
I, correct. Thank you. But like Tom, yeah. you're a town councilman in Front Royal, which is on on local television channel and then put on the web. And I think that affects the decorum um, because I know we cover we cover my three papers. We cover Lynchburg, which is very uh, much actually more advanced. They have their own cable channel, their own TV crew that tapes everything. Anytime two city officials get together, there's a crew there and they put it on the public access channel um, or the government channel. And then in Front Royal, they have uh, uh, they put the council things on the council meetings and the board of supervisors meetings. And then there's like a slideshow the rest of the hours. Uh, and then in other towns, like in Middletown, Virginia, which is a town of only like 1,100 people, there's no video. The, the town doesn't even have a website. Um, and they – it's just a knockdown, drag out fight sometimes. Those meetings are incredible. I mean in the last one we, we covered, uh, someone said, well, the mayor you know, was, was critical of the mayor and the mayor said, well, there's the door you know, if you don't like it to a council member. I mean just – I can't imagine. I've seen you guys get kind of out of control sometimes. Um, but nothing like that, you know. It's just I think that that has an impact. It, no, if you know you're being that. watched, yeah, if you know you're being watched, go ahead. Yeah. Most people are on their very best behavior when the camera's on. Um, Emily, what was your experience? I, I guess in yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear you, Emily. When you were in Boston, I guess they, they were pretty advanced this way, probably television. And, and I'm guessing when, when you would see a council meeting or any kind of public meeting that was on TV, that they would act a lot more formal than they would um, when you'd interview them afterward. Yeah, you know, I actually didn't have any experience with the council or anything like that in Boston. <laughs> we, uh, we were more on the side of, um, you know, we local politicians and the police, I guess, is what we were covering more than anything. Um, so I, I couldn't say, but I know that yeah, Lynchburg is very much on TV, and you know the council meetings here still get goofy sometimes. <laughs> I mean, not rude, but definitely they they get a little giggly in some meetings. I remember a training session in Lynchburg when they were all issued iPads, and uh, Tom, you should lobby for this for Front Royal because they discovered the cost of printing all those packets. It was much much cheaper to issue every council member an iPad. And then they saved a couple hundred dollars by getting the older version, um, the iPad, the original, not the iPad 2, after the 2 came out. But they found they saved a fortune in, in giving – because all their laptops, they were issued – they used to be issued laptops, but they were really old and nobody used them anymore. And so they found it was much cheaper than printing all the packets to just do them electronically and issue everybody an iPad. Um, and of course, but the, the, watching the mayor, you know, as they showed that the, you could turn it sideways and it flipped, and, the, and what, the mayor said, "Oh, that is so cool," or something. It was funny in the training session. But yeah, uh, any final thoughts? We probably should wrap this up because I know Emily's on a phone line, and we've got to we got to scoot. Any final thoughts, uh, We're Tom? To move. Well, I'm we sorry. Are trying to move more and more to a paperless. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. We are. We are trying to move more and more to a paperless society, and here in Front Royal, we are we're trying to do that more and more. We're sending out email that has attachments to it that has a lot of the paper stuff in it, and instead of you know having you know mounds and mounds of paper at work session, we just look at it over our email. I guess that's a good thing. Um, any final thoughts, Emily? Um, nope. I just, you know, to bring up something that Tom has said, people are best behaved when they're on camera, which I guess ties into our first topic. You know, <laughs> if people yeah. are best behaved when they're on camera, we should be able to take the police. Yeah, one one point to make is yeah, in Virginia. One point to make on that story, our lead story uh, in Virginia, I was talking to Clay Athey about this earlier. He's a local delegate and an attorney, as Tom is, um, and it's his it's his birthday tonight. And he, uh, I was going to see if he could come on with Tom, and um, he, could, he couldn't. <clears throat> but uh, he's shared that in Virginia, of course, this whole notion of would be anathema, that you couldn't record a, a public official doing their duty on on the clock. you know. And he said that in Virginia, in fact, many localities – are putting these cameras in the police car. So as soon as they turn their lights on or pursue somebody, that thing's rolling, recording everything they do. And other time, and some localities I've seen where they actually have an audio recorder on the officer's um, 
you know, in his uniform, when it's getting the audio up close as, as they interact, you know, have a verbal transaction with uh, um, a citizen. So anyway. All right. Well, I want to thank uh, Emily Williams, as always, uh, senior political writer for the Lynchburg Times. You can catch her awesome writing at lynchburgtimes.com. You can also catch her on Google+. Plus. She is gplus.to slash Emily KW. And I want to thank Front Royal Virginia attorney Thomas H. Sayer, member of the Front Royal Town Council. I don't know, Tom, do you have a website or should people just Google you, Thomas H. Sayer, Front Royal? Well, I do have a website in my law office. It's sayerlawoffices.com. All right, sayerlawoffices.com. And uh, we appreciate you coming on and offering us your insight and appreciate you uh, doing some homework at the last minute uh, to, to brief up on this. But um, I know that that's your specialty. You've always been someone to absorb all the details and uh, be able to put it in layman's terms for us. It's so always thank a pleasure, Dan. It's always a pleasure to work with you, and I, and I greatly have enjoyed being in, uh, and listening with Emily here. Awesome. Well, th- uh, thank you both, and uh, that's it. Tomorrow night is Google Plus Week, our most popular show. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the newest social network in our unofficial look. That's Google Plus Week starting 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific tomorrow night. Thanks to um, Scott in the chat room, my new moderator over there. Uh, looks like he's bumped a bunch of people off. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that's it for tonight. I will see you Monday with the new McDermott Report tomorrow night with Google Plus Week. Have a great evening.